before Ken goes out the door, and the reason he's leaving is he's heard me speak before. <laughs> now, uh, before Ted goes out the door, I do want to make a point. You know, it was in 2001, 2002, I first started to get involved with statewide politics. And I've been a county commissioner, and I began to travel the state, and I came to the 6th district. And at that time, Ted was the district vice chairman. The chairman was our former state vice chairman, Jean Ann Harcourt. And Jean Ann Harcourt named, if you will, nicknamed, the 6th district of Indiana as the gung-ho district. And it is because in this district, and it was true under Jean Ann, and it has remained true under Ted, as he said, it, it, I know it sounds like, well, yeah, that's what you'd say, you're new to the district, we're all family. I'm telling you more, and I shouldn't say this, as someone who covers the whole state, but more than any other district in Indiana, I can consistently see in the 6th that type of real family thing, and it is the gung ho district. It's why people like Mike Pence get elected in this district, why you're going to elect a great congressman, and why it is such a conservative district and a leader in the state of Indiana. It's because of Ted, and on behalf of Ted and everybody else, thank you all for being in the 6th district and being part as excited as Ted is to keep going. Well, I am delighted to be with you tonight. Um, I shared with a couple of you when I was shaking hands earlier, you know, it's a very humbling thing for a guy from Darnstadt, Indiana. I heard a chuckle there. I see your eyelids go. How many of you know where Darnstadt, Indiana is? About three or four, okay. Well, don't feel too superior. The people in Darnstadt don't know where Manville or Vive or the Bay is either, for that matter. Uh, Darnstadt is, well, if you got in the river and you just kept going, you got to Evansville and turned right about eight miles, that would be Darmstadt. So whenever I'm this close to the Ohio River, I always feel at home. But what I started to say is when you're a guy from Darmstadt, Indiana, and you travel the state as much as I do, and I see these yard signs and these four by eight signs and these handmade signs up all over the state supporting my candidacy for the United States Senate, I will tell you it is a great humbling thing. And I thank all of you who have been involved in doing that. I know there are many of you in the room, so thank you for doing it. I do want to say just a quick word about this Senate race and this primary, because uh, it was February 22nd of last year when I announced I was going to go down this road, and we were going to have this primary race for the Senate seat here in Indiana. And there were about 200 people that gathered on that February 22nd, literally above the intersection of Illinois Street and Washington Street in downtown Indianapolis. There's a big glass structure you may have seen called the Arts Garden. We had 200 people there, and I began my announcement that day by making a promise to them and basically committing a vow to myself by starting that meeting with a round of applause for Senator Dick Lugar. And I said we were going to do it then as a tribute to someone who had given 50 years of his life to public service. And when this race ends, no matter how it ends, on May 8, 2012, we will do that again. Dick Luger is someone I respect. He is someone I have voted for many times, as I suspect all of you have as well. But I do have differences. I certainly see myself as more conservative than Mr. Luger, and I won't go through all that tonight. But, you know, as a Republican, as someone who believes in the free market, I've always thought competition is a good thing. It causes businesses to compete, they develop better products, better quality, and they end up being sold to consumers at a lower cost. That's the benefit of competition. If competition is good in the commercial marketplace, it is equally good in the marketplace of conservative ideas. And so we have now, just as of tonight, we will have 15 days until primary day. And I'm thrilled with what we're seeing. I take nothing for granted. We're going to work hard the next 15 days, and then we're going to work even harder the next six months, because we are going to make sure the Senate seat that is up this year remains in Republican hands. So stay tuned. Again, I would ask you all for your vote, but that's all I'm going to talk about for the primary. I'd really rather talk about being a Republican. And I am thrilled to be here and to understand what Josh is doing and hear all the accolades coming for Josh and how you're building this party. That's a great thing. I want to give you two quick stories. One was just last night. I was in Crawford County. I spoke at their Lincoln Day dinner. There were about 200 people in the room. Why do I mention it? Because a few years ago, you couldn't have, if, if they would have had a room one quarter of this size and filled it half full, they would have considered that a success in Crawford County, Indiana. 
But just as the party started to come together with great candidates like Judd McMillan and others, they built and built and built, and they are soon looking very good, like this year, they're going to be controlling almost every county office in Crawford County. A relatively quick turnaround. I began in politics in 1988, and just to the east of Vandenberg County is Warwick County. Every single office back then in Warwick County was held by a Democrat. Today, I don't believe there is a single office held by a Democrat. And I give you those two examples to let you know how they did it. They did it by not sitting back. They did it by becoming involved. They did it by having, first and foremost, a very active women's group. And so when I heard it said here that Kay is signing people up, and by the way, you don't have to be a woman to join the women's group. <laughs> they will take checks from anyone. <laughs> but I, I'm serious. In every successful county where there is a successful Republican organization, and Misty can tell you that, Mindy can tell you that, Mark will tell you that, in all those counties, there are successful women's groups because that always serves as a foundation. So please, tonight before this is over, stop and talk to Kay. Or, you know, the Jefferson County equivalent is here. Go see, go to Helen Cope. And I've always wanted to say, go to Helen Cope. <laughs> because Helen's the representative from over there. Republicans have fun. We really do. And women's groups are an essential part of that. Well, if you've been here when I spoke uh, a couple years ago, or if you've ever been to any of the events where I have spoken, you probably know I always have to talk about American history. Thank you for coming. Just to set this up, if you haven't heard me speak, some 35 years ago, I gave myself the goal of reading at least 10 pages of American history every night. Haven't done it every night, but most nights I have. Lately, I've been eating too many chicken dinners to do it. <laughs> but the more I do it, the more I've come to love this country and to appreciate this incredible heritage that we have as Americans. And I want to speak a little bit from some things I've learned of history and maybe even bring them back a little bit here to Switzerland County. I want to start by talking about that great Hoosier, that young man who came to Indiana in 1816, who lived here 14 years, Abraham Lincoln. You know, he, it is said Abraham Lincoln spoke with a Hoosier accent. People in Illinois can say what they want to. They can claim themselves as the land of Lincoln. But he didn't sound like an Illinoisan. He spoke with a Hoosier accent. And there are many stories I can tell you of Mr. Lincoln. I can take hours. I won't, I promise. But I want to explain to you one of his basic philosophies of governing. And what he saw that was so unique about America. He once said that Ours was the sole government on the face of the earth that has as its primary purpose the elevating of all men, the lifting of artificial weights from the shoulders of all, so that all might have an equal and unfettered, I love that 19th century word, an unfettered chance in the race of life, unquote. Abraham Lincoln believed that every single American had the right, as he would say, to rise. To rise, to do your best, to try to succeed, to attain things that as a young person you might never dream you could attain, but by adulthood if you worked hard, you'd have some setbacks to be sure. But you had that right to rise. Why do you suppose Abraham Lincoln believed that was true? Because he spent his first three years in Indiana effectively living in a lean-to, in the wilderness, where there were bears and wildcats that still ran through, at that time, Perry County. Today, where he lived was Spencer County. Of course, Abraham Lincoln thought anyone had that right to rise because he could look at his own history. A guy who lived in a lean-to ends up serving as the 16th president of the United States. It can only happen, he thought, in America. I want to share with you another brief story that I find fascinating. It is of one of those very ordinary Americans 
who decided to try to rise and did. In short order, I'm sure you'll identify this person. Born in Illinois, his father was a shoe salesman, he had a brother, the four of them, his brother and parents, moved from town to town in Illinois in the early part of the 20th century. And they moved around a lot because the father had a problem. He was an alcoholic. Every time it seemed they'd start to have a little bit of prosperity, the father, Jack, would go on a bender. And the two boys would have to find him and drag him home. And back then, if you were caught in such a state, you were pretty well disgraced. And so the family would move to some other town. And they'd start all over again. That young man was no particularly outstanding student. He had a lot of things going on in his life. But he worked hard. Decided that he was capable of going to college. He never even considered going to one of the big Ivy League schools or a big state school because he just thought he'd never qualify for that, never get in, might not have the money to do it. So he packed up and headed off to a little college in Iowa. It's called Eureka College. Any of you ever heard of it? A few of you. Probably because of its graduate. He was, again, he was an okay student, but he had to work his entire college years. Wasn't any scholarship. Wasn't anything he could do to pay his way through other than to work hard. He had one job all four years in college. He washed dishes in the women's dormitory. He later said it was the best job in his whole life. <laughs> but that was Ronald Reagan's kind of humor, wasn't it? Ronald Reagan graduated with a degree in economics. The only president, ultimately, to ever have a degree in economics. Couldn't we use him now? <laughs> he came out of school, liked economics, obviously. But during his last two years at Eureka, he got involved with the college play. And he enjoyed being on stage. He enjoyed being in the spotlight. And so, when he came out of college, he decided to try to get some sort of job in the entertainment business and went to radio. Radio was just beginning. He had an amazing mind, an amazing imagination. Now you have to understand back then when they would broadcast a football game, the way they'd do it, the radio station, the equipment, you couldn't pick it up and carry it to the way the football stadium was. So they'd have a little ticker tape system. And there'd be one point, one person at the stadium who's tapping out what's happening on a play-by-play -play basis, they would send it to the radio station, the person at the radio station would read it and try to make it sound like he was at the game. When Ronald Reagan had his audition, he wasn't even aware that's how they did it. And so they invited him in, asked him to do his audition, and he just started broadcasting the game out of his head, out of his mind that he had attended the week before. And in his mind he could see it, and he went through the entire first quarter of the game without anything in front of him. Described it play by play. An amazing memory, an amazing sense of imagination. From radio, of course, he went off to Hollywood. A handsome guy, started to pick up some roles. Nothing real outstanding at first, but he became a pretty well-rated actor, ultimately. He was well-liked by the ladies. Very a Golden Globe winning and Academy Award winning actress, Jane Wyman. The marriage didn't last, but they used each other's career a bit and elevated themselves. Perhaps not intentionally, but that's what happened. Ronald Reagan's career was starting to, at best, plateau when he forgot the first rule of acting, which is you never appear on stage or in front of a camera with a child or an animal. <laughs> They'll steal the scene every time. He made a movie in 1957 called Bedtime for Bonzo with a Chimpanzee. <laughs> and his career was pretty well over. He couldn't get a job on the big screen, so he moved to television. Began narrating something called Death Valley Day. Some of you will remember it. And he would tell a little story and it would set up a little half-hour TV show. It was sponsored by General Electric. 
And the real reason General Electric hired him, as Reagan described the job himself, he said it was to be a pitch man. Which is to say they wanted Ronald Reagan because he couldn't stand up and give a pretty good presentation all those years in the theater, all those years of acting. They wanted him to go to all the plants, to all the factories that General Electric had in the country, and basically have a little pep rallies for the employees, telling them why what they were doing was important to the American dream, why it was important to the American economy, why their role on that assembly line was important. Believe it or not, Ronald Reagan loved that time in his life. He used to write little three-by-five note cards of what he wanted to say. And if you see those cards today, there have been several books written now from them. The words that he delivered back in the 1950s and 1960s are as fitting today as they were then. As you know, he went from there into politics. He gave a speech in 1964 at the Republican National Convention that really launched him. He was friends with Barry Goldwater, an arch conservative, when it was not even hardly used in pleasant company, that word conservative. They were seen as the far right wing renegades. And yet Ronald Reagan stood by his friend Barry Goldwater. And after he gave a rousing primetime TV speech, it was Ronald Reagan who really came out of that 1964 convention as the most viable political candidate. He was elected governor and then re-elected governor of California and ultimately then began to look at the White House. And then he did the unthinkable in politics. He ran against an incumbent Republican United States president and almost won. Of course, Jerry Ford had come in after Richard Nixon and he tried to patch the Republican Party back up after the Watergate scandal. But the fact was, he was far to the left of Ronald Reagan's view of Republicanism. And he put on a challenge, he, Reagan, did, and almost defeated an incumbent. Of course, that fall, Jimmy Carter became president of the United States. I used to say Jimmy Carter was the worst president of American history. <laughs> <laughs> I don't say that anymore. But the point of my story, in setting all that up, is just to make the point of these parallels. During Jimmy Carter's four years, the economy was terrible. It didn't start that way, he took it that way. During the 1980s, 1976 to 1980, interest rates hit 14%. I'm sorry, inflation rates hit 14%. Interest rates got up to nearly 20%. When my wife and I built our home that we still occupy over in Evansville, we built it in the summer of 1980, and at that time, the first mortgage we had was 16 and 3 quarters percent. It was an incredible time. Jobs were being lost. For the first time, there was a major energy crisis during those four years. And if you're old enough to remember, there was gasoline rationing. Even number, odd numbers days. I don't know what it was in this part of the country, but where I was growing up, over in Ohio, if you had an even number at the end of your license plate, you went in on Mondays, Wednesdays, and third, uh, Fridays, and if you had an odd number, you went in on the other days to the gas station. And worse still, America was seen in decline around the world. How bad did it get? It got so bad that a group of militant Shiites in Tehran, Iran, stormed the United States Embassy and took 53 Americans hostage and held them day after day after day. You remember we used to see them every night on the news with pillowcases jammed over their heads, their hands tied behind their backs, being marched up and down the streets of Tehran. And I personally don't ever recall a time when I was more frustrated as an American. We felt helpless because Jimmy Carter was hapless. The economy was falling apart, our place in the world was sliding, and it seemed there could be no recovery. And then came candidate Ronald Reagan in 1980. He said he was going to rebuild the military, he was going to strengthen our economy, he was going to reduce government, he was going to lower taxes. And he was criticized by Republicans and Democrats both. In fact, during the primary season, one of his opponents said he was too old. One said he was trigger happy. Another one said his economic plan was, and I quote, voodoo economics. And yet, he persevered, he won the nomination. And even 
six weeks before the election, it looked like Jimmy Carter might be reelected. Until Ronald Reagan really began to talk tough about what was happening to America's position in the world. And then people started to pay attention. We were tired of being down. We were tired of being out. We were tired of feeling that we had lived through America's best days and those were always going to be in the rearview mirror. And we started to see in Ronald Reagan the idea that the future could be rebuilt. <clears throat> Americans elected Ronald Wilson Reagan with the biggest landslide ever against an incumbent president. 22 minutes, 22 minutes after Ronald Wilson Reagan said, so help me God, 53 Americans were released from the embassy of Tehran, Iran. They recognized it was a new American president who meant what he said and said what he meant. That very image of the first day, of the first term, of Ronald Reagan began to put this country back on course. You know, he had a Lincoln-like quality. And I say this as a serious student of Abraham Lincoln. He had a Lincoln-like quality of looking at the people who had worked against him to say, when it was over, it doesn't matter. I don't care what you did. I recognize what you can do. Come join me. Many of you may have heard or read the book Team of Rivals about Abraham Lincoln, how he ran against these four people for president in 1860 at the Republican Convention. He brought them all into his cabinet, right? Well, that person that said that, he, uh, that Ronald Reagan was trigger happy was who he chose to be his Secretary of Defense. That person that said he was too old is who he named to be his Secretary of State. And that person who said his economic plan was voodoo economics was a guy by the name of George Herbert Walker Bush that he had to serve as Vice President. Ronald Reagan had the self-confidence in his own ideas that he knew he could bring out the best quality of others to fill that greater goal. Ronald Reagan as a Republican as a Republican, not only changed America, he changed the world. I could give you a dozen stories, but I will close with this one. There was at one point, shortly before the re-election of 1984, there was a peace movement. And there was a move to have the United States take down its number of nuclear weapons, and go to a nuclear freeze. One of the biggest groups that had always backed Ronald Reagan were the evangelical groups. And believe it or not, they turned on Ronald Reagan, or began to, because they were concerned that he was too militaristic and they wanted to see us bring our number of weapons down. And he asked to speak to a large convention down south, and he did. And there he said, do not be tempted by pride. Do not be tempted to assign equal guilt to both sides in the arms race. Do not forget the naked aggression of the evil empire. People went crazy at that. Presidents don't call a country an evil empire. He had just called out the Soviet Union. The liberals, the leftists, the democrats, the socialists. Forgive me, I repeat myself. <laughs> they went crazy. <coughs> they went crazy saying, you can't do that. That's wrong. You're going to make them mad. And his speechwriters kept trying in the weeks following to take those words out, and he kept putting them back in, saying, I call them an evil empire because they are. I've come to have a friend whose name is Ken Tomlinson. Ken is retired now, but he was the head of Voice of America during the Reagan administration. One of his proudest possessions is a note that he received from the president himself. Because people in Congress were telling the Voice of America stations not to broadcast behind the Iron Curtain that message that the president was calling him an evil empire. And Tomlinson kept the message up and kept it up. And he got a little thank you note from the president. He treasured it. The note says, Ken, just keep doing what you're doing. As much as we in America felt perhaps pride that we had a president who would say what he meant and meant what he said. We had no idea how his words were penetrating. One night 
in January of 1985, inside the confines of a Siberian gulag, a prison, there was an inmate there whose name was Anatoly Sharansky. He was locked up because he dared to think that he should have intellectual freedom, that the government shouldn't ban him from reading whatever he wanted to read. He'd called demonstrations together just to argue for intellectual freedom, and so he found himself in the Siberian gulag. And yet somehow the word of what was happening in the West got to him. And that night in January of 1985, he took the back of a carton of cigarettes and a little stub of a number two pencil, and he wrote a note. He rolled it up real tight, passed it on to the one friendly guard in the place who smuggled it to his sister, who gave it to her cousin, who took it to Paris, who put it in a box and sent it, and a few days later, it was on the desk in the Oval Office. And that note said simply this, Dear Honorable Mr. President Reagan, do not cease in speaking the truth, for you give us hope. Hope. It wasn't the kind of hope that said somebody else might pay your medical bill. The Obama type of hope. It was the type of hope that people might live in a world where they too had that right to rise where they too might have freedom to speak out. In sending that message, Ronald Reagan recreated the image of the United States of America as, in Lincoln's words, that last best hope of Earth, or as Reagan would say, that shining city on the hill. What does all of that have to do with the Switzerland County GOP? Everything. Josh said it, Ted Ogle said it, what you do as a county impacts the state GOP. And what we do as a state GOP influences the National Republican Party, and that influences leadership like Ronald Reagan. You know, the, the Democrats here in Switzerland County, when they have a dinner like this, right now, not for long, but right now they probably have more people than you have. You know what they do with the money they raise? They send it to the state. You know what the state does with that money? They send it to get Barack Obama re-elected president of the United States. What can you do as Republicans? Are you willing to rise yourself to help more people understand who we are as Republicans? That we don't wish to take their freedoms away. We wish to have them enjoy that sense of freedom and optimism and hope that says we can all rise. That's the legacy of Abraham Lincoln, of Ronald Reagan, and I hope it is the prologue of the Switzerland County Republican Party. Thank you all.